After a holistic analysis of Islamic law in the preceding chapters, it is logical to round up with perceptions on the practice of Islamic law into the future. In 1959, James Anderson identified in his Islamic Law in the Modern World that the legal systems of the Muslim world may be broadly divided into three groups. 1. Those that still regard the Sharia as the fundamental law and still apply it more or less in its entirety. 2. Those that have abandoned the Sharia and have substituted a wholly secular law. And 3. Those that have reached some compromise between these two positions. He cited, at the time, countries such as Saudi Arabia, northern Nigeria, Yemen, and Afghanistan as examples of the first group, Turkey as an example of the second group, and countries such as Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Tunisia, and Morocco as examples of the third group. The situation is much more strengthened today in most Muslim-majority countries with constitutional provisions recognizing the application of Islamic law in one form or another. For example, Saudi Arabia asserts full application of Islamic law as state law with Article 1 of the Saudi Basic Law of Governance, 1992, providing that its constitution is the Quran and the Sunnah, which are the ultimate sources of reference for all laws in the country. Relevant traditional mechanisms and institutions for the implementation of Islamic law are maintained, but with some in a reformed mode. Article 48 of the Basic Law provides that the courts shall apply rules of the Islamic Sharia in cases that are brought before them, according to the Holy Quran and the Sunnah and according to laws which are decreed by the ruler in agreement with the Holy Quran and the Sunnah, while Article 46 provides that the decisions of judges shall not be subject to any authority than the authority of the Islamic Sharia. Other similar constitutional recognitions of Islamic law include Article 3 of the Constitution of Afghanistan, Article 2 of the Constitution of Egypt, Articles 4 and 12 of the Constitution of Iran, Article 2 of the Constitution of Iraq, the Ninth Schedule of the Constitution of Malaysia, Article 10 of the Constitution of Maldives, Articles 260, 262, and 275 of the Constitution of Nigeria, and Article 227 of the Constitution of Pakistan. There are also applicable statutes in the form of penal codes, personal status laws, and family codes based on Islamic law in different Muslim-majority countries today. Classical fiqh continues to apply in different Muslim jurisdictions, with Hanafi jurisprudence currently dominant in countries such as Jordan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Turkey. Shafi'i jurisprudence dominant in countries such as Indonesia, Malaysia, Somalia, Djibouti, and Maldives, Maliki jurisprudence dominant in countries such as Nigeria, Mauritania, and Bahrain, and Hanbali jurisprudence dominant in countries such as Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Islamic personal status law is also applied today in some secular Muslim minority countries such as Kenya, the Philippines, and Thailand where there are Qadi courts for its application amongst the Muslim minorities. Owing to the influence of modern state structures and modern modes of lawmaking, the form and application of Islamic law as part of state law today is not based strictly on direct reference to classical fiqh manuals, but indirectly through state legislation in the form of codified statutes. Rudolf Peters has observed in that regard that, as a result of the process of codification that has continued for nearly a century and a half, there are hardly any countries left where the Sharia is applied without codification. This means that nearly everywhere the state has assumed the power to determine what the Sharia norms are, at least in those fields that are enforced as part of the national legal system. This has led some, mainly Western, 
non-Muslim scholars to question whether this legislation can still be regarded as Sharia and as Islamic. Raising this question is not very relevant and betrays a certain polemical point of view. By arguing that codified Sharia is not Sharia and not Islamic anymore, they want to demonstrate that the re-Islamization of the law that was introduced in some countries was not real reintroduction of the Sharia. This is perceived as a transformation of Islamic law or the Sharia from jurists' law to statute law and a displacement of traditional ulama as sole interpreters of the Sharia, triggering theoretical debates about whether such statutes can still be considered as Islamic law. In engaging with that debate, Aharon Laish highlights Halak's view that traditional Sharia can surely be said to have gone without return. That view is very far-fetched if the term Sharia is restricted to the Quran and Sunnah, as both, in contrast to the Fiqh, have remained intact as fundamental material sources for Islamic law up till today, and understandably into the future. But if the view is confined to fiqh, or Islamic law in practice, then it raises two questions with regard to the future of Islamic law, one relating to form, and the other to content. In relation to form, the question is whether codification deprives Islamic law of its status as being Islamic. A strictly historical perspective that tends to restrict Islamic law to the past may argue that it does, while an evolutional perspective would see codification as part of the evolution of Islamic law. Codification ensures certainty of the law and is reflected in the compilation of basic legal codes, such as Kitab al-Kharaj, an Islamic revenue code written by Imam Abu Yusuf at the request of Caliph Harun Rashid during the classical period of Islamic law in the 8th century, also restricting the ulama, who are entitled to interpret the sharia to the so-called traditional ulama, is a very reductive use of the term ulama. In relation to content, it is noteworthy that most modern Islamic law statutes are often based on classical fiqh of a particular jurisprudential school, or a mixture of rulings from different jurisprudential schools using the principles of Tachayur and or Talfiq. The statutes also often refer to the concept of Ijtihad to justify any reforms that are made to classical Fiq on particular issues. For example, the preamble of the Moroccan Family Code 2004 indicates that the code was prepared by an advisory royal commission constituted of the finest experts and religious scholars who were advised by the king to rely on the provisions of Sharia and encouraged to use the ijtihad to deduce laws and precepts while taking into consideration the spirit of our modern era. Thus, the contents of most modern Islamic law statutes often substantively reproduce classical Islamic jurisprudence. Anderson highlighted this by reference to the modern codification of Islamic law under the Tanzimat reforms during the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, arguing that the codes were on the basis of precepts derived not from European law but from the Sharia and that the Majaya represents the earliest example of the reduction of Islamic law to the form of modern legislative enactment. One aspect of classical fiqh that may be affected by codified Islamic law is the flexibility of ikhtilaf, differences of juristic opinion, as the codified fiqh becomes the applicable law. However, the classical Islamic legal maxim, Hukum al-Hakim Yarfa al-Khilaf, the ruling authority's edict resolves jurisprudential differences, could be relied upon to justify such codification. Peters has argued credibly that in addressing the question of whether or not codified Islamic law statutes can still be considered as Islamic, the only correct answer would be that if Muslims hold that it is Islamic 
and a legitimate interpretation of the Sharia, which most Muslims do, there are no good arguments to view it differently. While the future of Islamic law in the Muslim world continues to attract academic debates, it is evident that Islamic law must continue to evolve into the foreseeable future in response to the dynamics of human society within the flexible limits of the Sharia. Certainly the Qur'an and the Sunnah will continue to serve as the fundamental divine sources, and classical fiqh will continue to serve as reference for statutory codifications, especially in the areas of family and personal status laws in most Muslim-majority countries. The rules of classical Islamic legal theory, usul al-fiqh, will also continue to be relevant in the jurisprudential debates regarding reforms to classical jurisprudential views into the foreseeable future. This concludes Islamic Law by Mas'ud e Baderin, narrated by Paul Bamer. Copyright 2021 by Mas'ud e Baderin. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Oxford University Press and was produced in the year 2021 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.